Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Good morning, dear colleagues. We have with us today uh, the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, Kalos Irtate. Prime Minister, thank you for accepting our invitation to address the Parliament and the people of Europe as part of our This is Europe debates. Europe is, after all, a Greek word. And the birth of democracy in ancient Greece gave an impetus to a creative spirit that produced the architecture, the art and the philosophy that have shaped Western civilization as we know it. No society before the Greeks dared to believe that order and freedom were compatible. And with the return of war on our continent and power politics on the global stage, we are reminded of the importance of safeguarding democracy hand in hand with our rules-based order to preserve freedom over autocracy. In over 40 years of membership, Greece has given the European Union influence and stability in the southeast Mediterranean, and no doubt Greece's importance will continue to grow as a new geopolitical reality unfolds. Greece will become an energy hub connecting the Greek electricity grid with the Middle East and Africa will soon accommodate imports of lower cost renewable energy into Europe. And this signals a new age for Greece. This summer, we'll also see Greece exit the Eurogroup's enhanced surveillance framework, which helped stir, steer Greece's economy out of a crisis which began 12 years ago. It was not easy. This year marks the end of a cycle of restrictions and close monitoring. A new era of sustainable economic growth and prosperity is opening up for Greece and its people. So today, we salute Greece and every Greek citizen for this important milestone achieved. Thank you, dear Prime Minister, for being with us to mark this success. Dear Kyriakos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Allow me to address this house uh, in, uh, in Greek. Kyria Proedre. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, members of the European Parliament, many, many thanks for this uh, invitation to speak uh, as behalf of Greece to the 27 member states uh, of our union at a time which corresponds to the end of a very difficult chapter for both Greece and Europe, but also with a start of new joint efforts in the face of the major challenges of the future, which are already knocking on the door of our European family. Now is the time to courageously plan the European Union for the decades ahead. In 2015, Greece was one step away from the abyss of leaving the European Union. In its society then, there were waves of blind populism striking time and time again. But on the 5th of July, 2015, same date, a uh, referendum was conducted which uh, almost gave the coup de grace. It was only in the face of the uh, question of uh, uh, an unregulated uh, bankruptcy that the, the government stepped back, but there was a serious effect on the banks, the capital controls, and also a third memorandum, which took us to another cycle of austerity. 
no European society has suffered more than Greek society in the past decade. Luckily for my country, Greece in 2022 cannot be compared to Greece of 2015. Seven years on, I am standing here before you to say to you that those images have been deleted forever. My country has a new government which is leading our country into a new age, which wants to push development, uh, reducing unemployment and increasing, increasing investment. And in a month from now, we will be shaking off the enhanced surveillance framework. So we are ready over the next year, within 2023, to, uh, to uh, uh, increase investment. So we look to the future in a more optimistic fashion, despite the major challenges out there. But I'm standing here in order to express a huge message of thanks to Europe. Europe that supported my country when others were questioning the whole European approach. All of you who helped us to stay as a supporter of democracy in the most uh, democratic of countries, that was a sign of solidarity. And uh, we are referring that back to uh, Europe now in uh, aiming, in pulling together towards our common social objectives. Yes, there have been dramatic crises, but we've learned from them. So, who would really have believed some years back that Greece, uh, which was at the end of the line in terms of development in Europe 10 years ago, would be third in line now? Who would have thought that Greece could achieve their, that by reducing taxes three times, but also without threatening uh, social stability. Who would have believed some years back that Greek uh, public service, the symbol of red tape, would today be much more digital and much more citizen friendly? So we have turned the page. We've changed. And the Greeks themselves, um, they believe only in the truth of their votes because they are now seeing the results of the very brave measures brought in by a reforming government. And the quality of our democracy has also been improved. And uh, we've shaken off the neo-Nazi threat from uh, Golden Dawn. So I'm very proud as a Greek to be able to say that uh, my country has taken control of its economy, it's changed its country. And it is now an active and equal member of the European Union. Athens was one of the first in line in uh, combating COVID with uh, vaccinations with the Greek proposal for Euro a Euro European vaccination pass, which was adopted. It was also one of the first countries to stress the need to, sh to shape a new European fund for the recovery of our economies post-COVID. One of the first countries that uh, actually had a national uh, plan for next generation EU. That's not all, because at the same time, Greece has stood as a guardian of Europe. In 2020, in March, when on our eastern borders, there were constant threats of invasion by tens of thousands of illegal migrants from Turkey. I remember back then, in a uh, action of solidarity, 
within 48 hours on our borders on the Evros River, the President of the European Parliament, our beloved David Sassoli, was present, the President of the European Council, and also the President of the European Commission. That is something which remains dramatically present, uh, as we've seen now what migrants are facing in Spain. But we've seen also the actions which are ongoing with the, the smugglers working on land and on sea. And unfortunately, um, this is becoming more frequent. But as a European, uh, I would like to stress that the European foundations have stood up to it and have managed to find new solutions to new challenges. We have seen the European Bank uh, opening its doors to uh, the uh, state bonds. We've seen the um, European semester. There's been new mechanisms introduced and at the same time, there has been constant technical uh, support for the General Directorate bringing in change. But Europe, at the same time, has supported Greece, working alongside it along the path towards these major changes. And it's been clearly understood that national challenges are often uh, European ones, so there is no role for local uh, egoism. We can only have solidarity if the state towards that uh, which that is directed is involved as well. So these are the dual foundations, I would say, of this new European construction. Members of the European Parliament, I spoke at the beginning about the major progress achieved by my country. In 2021, we showed uh, high develops of growth, much better than um, projected, uh, about 8%. We have seen an increase in investment and a reduction in unemploy unemployment. And we have seen changes in the public sector. Greece has met its uh, final uh, commitments to the IMF two years ahead of what was planned. We have got a better system. We have drastically reduced um, loans for Greek banks, and all of that is being shown in the figures. I know I'm speaking to uh, elected representatives here, and so I would like like to raise two issues which I think are very important of something which has been achieved as we have followed this path. Firstly, the conditions within Greek society was moving, and secondly, the fundamental uh, measures brought in on the social side to ensure that progress there in the social side could be going hand in hand with improvements on the economic side. And in the uh, environment, we have a uh, new approach under my government, uh, hybrid attack, and there have been national uh, threats in the Aegean from Turkey and in the Eastern Mediterranean, which uh, expanded in uh, 2020, there have been natural disasters, uh, fires, and then we were hit by the storm of the pandemic. On all of these fronts, we always strove to make crisis into opportunity. With the help of Europe, we better organized the protection of our eastern borders, our diplomacy. Well, we uh, entered into agreements on the protection of uh, sea areas with Italy and Egypt, uh, Israel as well, our links there, and increasing our defence, establishing um, 
serious conditions for uh, mutual protection with France and also an agreement with the United States. And as I say, we've made the crisis into a driving force. I think this is was seen in the pandemic as well, because we've seen uh, a doubling uh, of um, the wards available and staffing has been taken on. But this has become a reason to study a new public national health system. In my country already, um, they, we are moving towards a free uh, public GP for all and we're working on all areas of primary and secondary care. And this leads me to my uh, second, the second comment I mentioned uh, about the social moves despite the international and national uh, conditions. Now, this is a country which is coming out of a very painful, tragic uh, crisis financially and it's hit by another but is, is striving to remain focused on its aims and support the well-being of its society. Throughout the pandemic, we spent tens of thousands to support firms and workers. We uh, provided tax relief to support investments and support uh, uh, revenue. We brought in major changes in the working environment with policies aimed at lower taxes, better uh, jobs and a better life. The increase in the uh, minimum wage, I think, has uh, also helped in that direction. We have a digital labour uh, card now as a uh, shield against misuse of workers. They can show very clearly um, how the conditions of their work and the hours they work. So we're adapting to European conditions. So there is no form of uh, distinction discrimination anymore because the same uh, rules apply across the board to our workers. In the face of needs and any progress we've made, we can't be fully satisfied, but this is the measure of our effort. We have achieved many well-paid jobs and this is something that all uh, we're all calling for um, across the political spectrum in the question of uh, training and education, increased investment, a new vision which focuses at progress in the economy going hand in hand with social progress. Colleagues, at the beginning, I said that nothing in Greece or Europe remains the same at the end of the second decade of this century. But there have been unprecedented changes coming about across the planet. The invasion, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. War has returned to our planet. It's upsetting the energy situation um, and the effects are spilling over into all European societies. The nightmare of a shortage of food is re-emerging in many countries around the world. And uh, we know that for every country, ever organisation, there is a question out there on what side of the various interests involved are we going to stand? Because we are going otherwise to end in a vacuum. The role of a fair partner 
has been mentioned uh, many times over history in Europe, from the European Parliament, also from Greece. We've always answered the question, and from the very beginning, we are on the side of peace and uh, an international rule of law against an invasion uh, and uh, an infringement, a violation of borders. We are for democracy uh, and a democratic society, and therefore we refuse this uh, autocratic neo-depotism. We, um, we always want to uh, support that approach. The struggle in Ukraine is uh, a turning point, I would say, in the history of Europe, the importance of which is becoming visible only if each state uh, does plays its role in line with its own requirements. We owe it to Ukraine to uh, reject any form of uh, approach like this which could become uh, another form of disruption in the future. And that's why, well, it's particularly important for two countries uh, which are members of Europe, uh, Greece and Cyprus, because I'm talking here about the ongoing threats from Turkey, which is looking towards Europe. Clear decisions from uh, the European Council uh, have been taken now, but we have to stand up for the international rule of law. In the face of provocation, we have to show readiness. In the Eastern Mediterranean, as we are facing the major challenge of this war in Ukraine, one thing stands for sure. We do not need new uh, uh, returns of these type of uh, approaches. One thing is for sure, Greece will not see anyone questioning its national sovereignty and its territorial integrity. And I'm sure that in this ongoing struggle, we will have all of you on our side. So my position has long been clear. We close the door to threats. We keep the windows open to attempts to achieve peace. Sometimes, well, differences between uh, difference between states must always be solved on the basis of international law. So there are not only geopolitical repercussions; they also have economic and social repercussions as well. These international disruptions are leading to a rise in the cost of all products, which in turn is giving rise to social discontent, logically, throughout all of our societies. So we face the risk of uh, populism arising once again. We need um, solutions to complex problems, and there are no magical solutions for that. Europe is therefore being called upon to face many challenges. Disruption and the question of this dependency on Russian energy. We must move faster on uh, green um, replacements and we also have to look at the question of energy prices as well. There's no doubt that we have to deepen democracy uh, in member states because uh, inequalities, distances between our politicians, our peoples continue to exist. We should avoid, or we have to speak to our um, citizens in a simple language every day, straightforward, talking about their uh, real needs and speaking against fake news. All of this represents the path for us to show that our national governments and the European institutions 
um, are not red tape, they are a system which are there to support all European citizens. Greece will be present for all of the crises ahead. We're one of the first countries to uh, uh, join the uh, European or support a European energy plan. And we are a constant uh, source, a port of entry for renewable energy coming in, not only to cover uh, Greece's needs, but we're looking at uh, the Balkans, Eastern Europe. We are pushing ahead with our connections with uh, Cyprus and Egypt, Cyprus and Israel, so that the entire continent can be provided with clean, cheap energy from the sun of Africa and the, the Middle East. In the question of strategic economy, uh, uh, autonomy for Europe, I would stress once again that we have a bridging role to play with the Balkans. And uh, we are also looking at the question of common uh, security within the framework of NATO. Only over the last few months, we have saved 6,000 people in, from the sea, all of them coming from Turkey. So we need, as I said at the beginning, a new plan to address this. For my country, I would like to say that as far as democracy is concerned, we have new the constitution. We have elected the first woman as the president of the Hellenic Republic. Um, we have passed large volumes of legislation recently, um, many looking at the uh, right to vote of Greeks living abroad who will be able to continue to vote. And we have also adopted unprecedented uh, reforms covering uh, rights within Greece. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's not only about what's happening in my country or on the continent. We have to look at the Europe of the future, which has to stand its grounds. It has to uh, establish its own defence and energy policy, building on what we have done so far in the green transition and on the Greece of cultures, which has to involve the entire world. I should say that despite the difficult circumstances, I am reading the situation with optimism. Europe has, was more effective in the many other parts of the world in the face of COVID. Other large countries, such as China, still hasn't got to to grips with it. It was a huge decision in Europe to have the common vaccination policy and uh, also the question of exchange at a supranational level so that we were able to uh, support our economies throughout Europe and we were able to overcome this major COVID crisis. It would have been impossible for that type of thing to happen three years ago. And uh, so uh, we are there in renewable energies, new technology. We have a new plan on climate change. And I know how interesting and difficult tomorrow's debate is going to be on this question of taxonomy. But despite the difficulties, democracy is always there in our countries. We have the will, but we have the culture of our peoples to build on. We have liberal forces, such as the United States as well, who uh, are looking, progress is there for us. 
the billions available under the new fund which has been set up and uh, we have to look at the title, the role, we have to bring about uh, recovery but uh, also we have to ensure that it is resistant. So we have drawn the consequences I think and learned the lessons from the four major challenges, the crisis, the pandemic and now the energy crisis. What have we learnt? Firstly, that in a connected world, no state can manage the crisis of these dimensions alone, however big it may be. And secondly, as I said, when Europe moved quickly with common mechanisms and decisions, it showed that it was resilient. And with those two lessons, I uh, would ask that we apply this now in the face of this huge uh, energy crisis. So, a united Europe means, in energy terms, united as well. We have to have the courage to intervene in the markets when they have basically stopped working. We have to break the link between the costs of uh, natural gas and the cost of other energies. And I see that now things are moving within the Commission to look at the way in which we um, price electrical energy on our continent. And I'm saying this as a, uh, uh, a liberal-minded politician and I'm able to look forward to the future. I would call for public intervention when markets stop working to the benefit of the citizens. Green economy with zero emissions, yes, it will exist, but how are we going to get there and how in the meantime are we going to bring about a quick green transition without uh, the, the budgets of our families being brought to their knees. These are the issues we have to address over the next month, particularly in view of the hard winter that lies ahead. I know we have to work together. My country will be providing uh, 2,000 uh, megawatts of new uh, possibilities for electrical energy this year. We know that we need further connections and so that no country in the European Union is excluded from the European networks. These are the major challenges we're going to be faced upon to, uh, to deal with. And we need a, an agenda of resilience and development for the whole of the European Union. I'll conclude with this thought so that I leave some time to take your questions. These are the major challenges we're going to be called upon to face and to respond to over the next years. The question of European defence, uh, common defence policy, bearing in mind also the uh, migratory challenges, um, um, banking union and savings, a, uh, an effective European energy plan and coordinated action based on the RRF, the deepening of democracy, uh, addressing um, fake news, demagogues, and uh, also the role of the uh, European Union in the Western Balkans, an enlargement. Greece, as uh, a Balkan country, fully supports that enlargement. We want Europe in the Balkans, but we also want the Balkans in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all aware of the fact that these are ongoing struggles. Well, Jan Kershaw, the historian, five years ago uh, wrote this in a uh, book that Europe fought for freedom and achieved it. And uh, together with uh, a prosperity for all the world, the call for unity and a clear feeling of identity continues to exist. But the only certainty is the uncertainty which uh, affects 
our lives. And I will close on that, adding that it is our duty to protect freedom, the freedom and the prosperity which have been achieved by previous generations for our benefit. But we also have to fight for the European identity uh, we wanted. But our first duty is to make stability a fact, because in the current circumstances, the strong states, strong states are stable st states. And that will strengthen the European Union. Uh, it will be strong in its stability for the benefits of uh, its citizens. I would like to thank you very much indeed for having given me the opportunity to speak today to the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Prime Minister, dear Kyriakos. We now uh, give the floor to the leaders of the different political groups, starting with the leader of the EPP group, Manfred Weber. Madam President, uh, dear Commissioners, uh, the Prime Minister, on the 7th of July 2019, almost exactly three years ago, you won Greek elections in a landslide victory. Greek people sent a strong message of support and trust to you and to Neo Democracia to steer the future of Greece and turn a page on failed policies of Alexis Tsipras and Syriza. When you came into office, Greece was in bad shape. I think that was obvious. After painful years, of poor leadership by Tsipras, uh, you put Greece back on track. And thank you for this remarkable and excellent work. Thanks to you and thanks to your government, Greece is back in Europe and that is good news. <clears throat> it is important for Europe to have Greece back. First of all, everybody I think should and must underline that Greece is in a way not a normal country because uh, democracy was born in Greece. Our Western civilization was born in Greece. Europe was born in Greece. And uh, not to mention the princess taken away by Zeus, uh, the beautiful Greek, uh, the princess who gave her name to our all joint project Europa. There is no Europe without Greece. Greece is back on economic issues. Last year, even in crisis times, Greek economy grew by more than 8%. When it comes to growth, Greece is among Europe's top five countries. You managed to reduce the unemployment in Greece. In Greece, uh, in the quarter from summer 2019 to February 2022, more than any other country, you did it. And the people feel the success in their daily life. Thanks to your efforts and to the determination of the government, Greece is finally also on the way to exit the surveillance uh, program. On another aspect, Greece is back, and that is about the security issues. Since you took over, Greece uh, seriously cares about security again. Greece, due to its uh, geographic position, is a key when it comes uh, to the European security. Europe is not to be criticized, but to thank Greece for protecting and defending our common external borders. And I want to be very clear on this. When I see that each and every single event on the border between Turkey and Greece is in this European Parliament an issue, then it's okay that we discuss the issues. But on the other hand, we saw in Spain, on the Spanish -Maroc, uh, Moroccan uh, border, an event where more than 20 people died. And I have to tell you that uh, socialists and Greens didn't initiate a debate about the events in Spain, but they, debate, uh, they initiate always a, a debate when it is about Greece. So we should care about the migrants and not about party political issues when it is about migrants. I have to be clear on this, that EPP is strongly on the side of our Greek um, authorities. Erdogan is misusing migrants as a political weapon, like Lukashenko did it. For us, that's clear. Our border guards who are doing every day the job are protecting people and the border, and we trust them. We are respecting their work every day in the interest of all of us. What we have to do is to strengthen Frontex and what we have to do is also to clarify the rules for pushbacks 
and I want to thank uh, Margarete Skinas for his work in this uh, clarification process. Greece is back also on geopolitical issues. Uh, Tsipras, I uh, have to say, mainly cared about Maduro. Uh, you care about the European interests in the Mediterranean, and that is good. Not only in the last uh, years do we witness an increasingly destabilizing role played by Turkey, dangerously raising the tensions in the region. What Turkey is doing is unacceptable. It is not a problem between Greece and Turkey, but a problem between Europe and Turkey. Greece's interests are European interests in this border conflict. And we all have to ask us, and probably, Mr. Prime Minister, you can reflect a little bit in your final statement, how do we best deal with Erdogan's Turkey, a Turkey that is becoming more and more provocative and aggressive? And Greece is back on foreign and defense issues. Putin and Erdogan tell us one lesson. Europe must grow up when it comes on foreign and security policy. It is great news that Finland and Sweden finally join the European uh, the NATO. And uh, as an EPP, our parties in Finland and Sweden always fought for becoming NATO members. The socialists finally also supported this uh, uh, approach. The EPP is fully supporting NATO, but we also think that Europe has to grow up. We must abolish the unanimous vote principle in the Council side when it comes to foreign affairs and within the NATO. We have to build a true common European defense with concrete projects like a cyber brigade or a European missile defense system. Europeans have to be capable to defend themselves if it is needed. And if you allow me, I want to finalize with a more general consideration because you delivered, Mr. Prime Minister, a great speech in the US Congress and, and Senate a few weeks ago. Um, it was a big honor for you to be there as one of the European leaders. And, um, when we look to the US, and we also look to our European democracies, we have to see that these democracies are under stress. We are facing populism and extremism. And the probably most fundamental question is, can we agree still in our societies about what is true? What is the reality? Because we have fake news discussions. You mentioned this. We have propaganda from China, from Russia, which try to change what is true the reality which we are based on. And without a common understanding in our societies about what is true, what is the reality, you cannot build up a lively democratic discussion between Green, Socialists, DPP, and so on and so forth. And people cannot decide. That's why the idea to strengthen this common, this common base is so important. Fight against propaganda. Too often it is un unanswered. We have to strengthen good and serious journalism, and we have to make clear that the tech giants have a responsibility. We will vote this week on DMA and DSA, which would give and will give an answer on these challenges. So thank you, dear Kyriakos. Thanks to you, Greece is back in Europe. The Greek people can be proud about these achievements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. And now on behalf of the S&D group, Nikos Andrulakis. Over the last uh, decade, Europe has faced a crisis after crisis, which has increased inequality and uh, has uh, meant that we have to all stand together to face the crisis. Um, as we've seen for uh, millions of Europeans, the possibilities for a better life being uh, reduced and uh, we've been seeing, therefore, increasing threats to, uh, to liberalism. Now, the forces in Europe have allowed the deniers of the European um, construction to exploit that. And this is the duo we have to uh, face up to, as you uh, said yourself some weeks ago. And I am speaking for the more conserv about the more conservative forces in Europe. If they do nothing, we won't be able to face up to this crisis. Popularism, elitism, they are just as catastrophic for Europe. But the world is changing, and uh, we have to be up to the changes. We need to do more and to do it now. We have to have a progressive framework towards solidarity, protecting uh, human rights and protecting the environment. 
we have to make our citizens feel safe again in the face of geopolitical uh, climate and economic, economic challenges of our times. We have to uh, establish recovery and resilience as a constant uh, uh, characteristic, particularly in the, German pe the, the Greek peoples who have faced such difficult situations. We need to strengthen the resistance of our society, societies and economies. It's good to remember the uh, referendum back in 2015, but let's be fair, we also remember very clearly the uh, humiliating times of uh, 2019 which uh, brought our country into uh, a facing major deficits and uh, we knew that the challenges were out there and it was them that opened the Pandora's box in Greece. So we have to talk about our young people. We have to create new opportunities in order to reduce migration. We have to uh, strengthen the markets. According to Eurostat, uh, the Greek citizens are uh, facing uh, much more than other European um, citizens. There is uh, not much uh, protection for them uh, in terms of uh, what other European countries with similar problems have done. Public investment, well, it's crucial that we do something about that as well. Uh, we have to look at the question of primary care and the national health system. We have to make sure that we have a lever to uh, develop further uh, sources of energy through the various funds available to us. Now, throughout the European Union, the aim is to decarbonize the economy, but you are uh, following a slightly different path as the laws recently uh, introduced in your country show. The European Commission is giving the possibility to uh, have national uh, plans to uh, upgrade also uh, energy possibilities in our countries using all the necessary sources so that we can uh, source um, cleaners, become more energy autonomous and have fairer distribution. We also have the, the disastrous invasion of Putin in Ukraine. It's a dreadful disaster for the Ukrainian people and a lesson for all of us in Europe. How can we face up to these leaders? As we've seen, there are uh, no results coming about. We need some serious measures to be, uh, to be established. We need uh, steps to be taken in terms of uh, the foreign approach. Through, after 10 years of ongoing crisis, the uh, Greek people has lost uh, a huge amount of its uh, GDP and uh, it's now spending a fortune on the sovereignty uh, in, in defense measures and defense spending to uh, support our sovereignty. So we need a uh, decision to be taken on uh, an embargo vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. And Mr. Weber, you were talking about supporting. Well, okay, but you personally voted against in the past and also it's pointless heads of uh, European state adopting measures when they support Erdogan. Erdogan, uh, if it continues to do what it's doing, is uh, automatically looking like a terrorist state. Colleagues, we have to look at violations of uh, rule of law. It's crucial for all of us. And uh, we, as should ensure that uh, um, everyone in Europe feels safe across the board. So we need serious changes to ensure that finally we do have a common foreign defence and security policy. At a moment in history where these nightmare scenarios which are threatening our uh, borders and they're coming back to the past, all of us, all of us, we must give new breath to the European dream. We have to uh, ensure that we can look to the future with more optimism and hope for all European peoples. Of the Renew Group, Malik Asmani.
Dear President, Lugupeetud Resimed, neid peaminister, Lugupeetud liikmed, oleme silmitsi detention of solidarity of all of us. The unjust and uncalled war of aggression raged by Russia in Ukraine is triggering new crises, an energy crisis, food shortages, and these two combined will lead to an economic and perhaps migration crisis. This continent needs to get ready for all of these and doing so while helping the Ukrainians fight their good fight. And it's quite simple. Mr. Putin must fail. Therefore, we must stand by the Ukrainian people with determination and sanctions alone are not enough to ensure Putin's failure. Ukraine needs our heavy weapons and here all of us have a duty to back our words with actions. There is one man responsible for the food crisis. That's Vladimir Putin. Food shortages risk many vulnerable adults and children. And they also are a risk of a migration crisis for Europe. And I'm quite certain a new migration crisis would seem very attractive to Mr. Putin. But we cannot let him succeed. We need to finalize a new European migration and asylum pact. We need a strict and fair system for the whole union to work. But we need the whole union to take its responsibility. And we need to do it now. We have waited for too long and the next migration crisis might be at our doorstep already. The council needs to move and this house needs to engage in pragmatic negotiating with them to reach a deal before the end of this year. Dear colleagues, I'm worried when I read some of the reports of violent deportations. And yes, we must uphold EU law. And yes, we must protect EU borders. And yes, we must ensure Turkey abides by its obligations to us. But we say no to illegal pushbacks of any kind in Spain, in Greece, or anywhere else. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you can agree with us in Renew Europe that the Europe of today needs to be bold so we can address the cost of living crisis facing Europeans, like the common solutions we found for the pandemic. Innovative thinking is needed to address our energy challenges. We need to boost our economic credentials by signing the free trade deals that are frozen. The deal with New Zealand last week shows us the way. Protectionism is no antidote to inflation. By investing in the modernization of our economies, by embracing competition, by improving our entrepreneurial and investment climate, we can continue to sail the ship of prosperity. Let's be bold and fight back against global economic headwinds. And then finally, dear colleagues, we see that in many countries, even within the European Union, the values and principles that breathe life into our democracies are under attack. And I will be frank, Prime Minister, as always. We are worried about the decline in press freedom and media pluralism in Greece. The warning lights are flashing. Greece now has the worst performance in the EU27 as far as media freedom is concerned. Mr. Prime Minister, I hope you agree with me that media freedom is central to our European way of life. Every new Europe has added a distinguished Greek MEP, Mr. Georgios Kitsos, to its ranks. He's sitting over there on the first row. Our family expects the voice of its representative to be heard according to European media rules and standards. We don't want to see another EU government leader slandering the free press. Because, as you know, it was Socrates who said, when the debate is over, slander becomes the tool of the loser. And we are aware that some in your political family have set a bad example. But please, Prime Minister, don't follow in their destructive footsteps. Stop it, Minister, Prime Minister, and stop silencing Mr. Kirchhoff, and stop it now.
hold the proud of the Greek tradition of public debate alive, and you will continue to find renew at your side, facing the crisis ahead together in unity. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor next on behalf of the Green Group to Tineke Strick. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners, dear Prime Minister, welcome in our house, and also Minister of European Affairs. During the Eurozone crisis, we have painfully witnessed in Greece how citizens suffer if the EU fails to act in unity and solidarity. And citizens should never anymore pay the price of a dysfunctioning monetary and economic union. Greece should be able to count on the union to fully reap the benefits of the green transition. But we also count on Greece to defend the fundaments of the union. A Europe based on democracy, rule of law, media freedom and non-discrimination. A Europe that respects fundamental rights, including human dignity and the right to apply for asylum. And I wonder, is this Europe as well, Prime Minister? If asylum seekers try to enter this Europe through your country, their rights are brutally trampled. They are pushed into the Turkish waters and land. Migrants are even forced to push back other migrants. And the border guards and masked men putting lives at risk enjoy impunity, but those who save lives are convicted. And therefore, I ask you, Mr. Mitsotakis, is this Europe? You're closing down the most human camps and force asylum seekers to live in remote and closed hotspots. You leave thousands of asylum seekers from Syria and Afghanistan in a legal limbo, using the fiction that they could return to Turkey, which they can't. And the lucky refugees that do get a status have to survive on the streets. Yet those helping refugees are restricted and criminalized. Those who speak up, including media, are silenced. But Prime Minister, covering up evidence doesn't help because the reality is recorded and reported time and time again by all relevant bodies of the UN, Council of Europe, by ombudsmen, NGOs and investigative journalists and European judges refuse to accept this reality as it violates EU asylum law. That, Mr. Mitsakis, is Europe. And let me be clear, other member states have put Greece in an unfair position. They breached the principle of solidarity by refusing a common responsibility for asylum seekers. We could be allies in combating these selfish policies and to have geopolitical answers to geopolitical conflicts. But sealing off the borders, deterring and pushing back refugees is not the European answer. And instead of trying to demonstrate the shield for Europe, I urge you to solve the many problems in your society. People are suffering from it. There are 36.8% young people unemployed. The high level of poverty the increasing use of fossil fuels right in this global crisis instead of investments in renewable energy. Use the EU funds to create innovative green and social jobs to transform your country into an inclusive, modern and sustainable state. Prime Minister, we count on Greece to honour the fundamental rights on which true European solidarity can be built both for the Greek citizens and for the refugees. Because there is no Europe left to protect or to defend if its core values are undermined. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strick. I give the floor next to Gunnar Beck on behalf of the ID Group. Thank you, President. Prime Minister Mitsotakis, welcome to the European Parliament. I'd like to congratulate you more than once. First, on paying off your debt to the IMF two years ahead of schedule. However, the euro is quite another matter. It's not served Greece well. Greek inflation stands at 
Rents in Athens are, are, are up about 17%, and petrol prices are approaching 3 euros per litre. Almost 30% of Greeks are at risk of poverty or social exclusion. One million Greeks work in the tourist sector, but the rental costs of sunbeds in exclusive resorts in Mykonos now equal the monthly minimum wage in Greece. Prices, price rises of up to 110% for Greek hotel rooms far exceed those in other holiday destinations. Layoffs in the Greek tourist sector therefore seem inevitable. Second, I'd like to thank you for your efforts in protecting Europe against the ongoing migrant invasion. Last week, you decided to triple the length of the border fence with Turkey, and you prevented smugglers from offloading over 1,000 illegal migrants on Greek islands. Third, I applaud your resolve in resisting aggressive posturing from Ankara. Greece's territorial integrity should be sacrosanct to the EU, more self-evidently so than that of neighboring non-EU countries. On the other hand, Prime Minister, I firmly disagree with you on the expansion of the European Empire. With the highest inflation rate since the 1970s, this is not the time to waste energy and money on making the Western Balkans fit for 55. Rather, we should focus on the Greek pensioner on 384 euros per month and the 14 million Germans who live near or below the poverty line. Further, your government recently decided to follow Germany in ordering F-35 American fighter jets. Instead, you could have favored European options to protect European, not American, workers and jobs. Finally, at a recent press conference on demographic change, you seem to adopt the logic of replacement migration, commending the integration of populations from Asia and Africa as a viable alternative or as a viable solution to low fertility rates instead of favoring imaginative family policies, Hungarian style. The truth is that European governments have failed us for 40 years. Even Europe's richest countries were never rich enough to allow most families to raise two or three children in modest comfort. And they're now importing millions of migrants, which will rarely work and usually live on welfare. Sadly, our, Eadley, our EU leaders are destroying our welfare state through the back door and European culture and civilization with it. Prime Minister, I implore you to resist von der Leyen's great replacement. Greece was under Ottoman rule for centuries. You have no reason to adopt Germany's guilt complex. I give the floor next to Emmanuel Frakos on behalf of the ECR group. Prime Minister, thank you very much for coming along today. As a young Greek, I'd like to look at the problem of the brain drain, a problem of people, particularly scientists, leaving Greece looking for a better future with, of course, negative consequences for Greece. I was in the Aristotelio University in Thessaloniki, recently and I was given the same kind of choice that lots of my colleagues had trying to leave in order to find a job and in, it seems that about half a million Greek students and uh, graduates have left the country with a huge cost to the national budget. Who's to blame for this? Obviously unemployment first of all, Eurostat's Figures have shown that Greece is number one in terms of youth unemployment in Europe, in Europe with figures of 30%. If you're 25 to 30, 
you are much more likely to be unemployed than the average citizen. It's difficult, therefore, to look for jobs within Greece, and this means that they have to do, young Greeks have to do often jobs which have little to do with what they study. Obviously, education isn't free. The cost has been estimated about uh, 33,000 euros per student. And if these people go to another country, that has been wasted. It's only damaging for Greece if that kind of thing happens. We need, of course, therefore, to encourage people to find a well-paid job by staying in Greece. And it's something has to be something that's to do with what they actually studied. This is a problem for Greece and the European Union. We don't have a kind of ecosystem which would allow young people to find a job using their own understanding and learning. It's important, therefore, that we try to persuade people to stay in Greece so that they're not clients but citizens, so that they can raise a family and face up to the huge population problem that Greece is facing. It's important, therefore, that we deal with this issue. And I mentioned another problem, the population problem. The average family in Greece has 1.2 children, and we actually need to have two children per family if Greece as a nation is going to survive. Uh, young people, scientists have told us, need to come back home, the ones who have left because of the, grain, the brain drain, if the country is going to survive. They do come back home if they've studied abroad or worked abroad in other countries. We have to ask ourselves why they're not doing the same thing in Greece. Not a great deal has been done to address this problem. So I'd like to ask you two questions about that issue, Prime Minister. First of all, can Greece attract back all of those Greeks who left the country during the crisis years? And secondly, what are you going to do personally to try to address this problem? Thanks very much, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Frakos. Next, on behalf of the left group, Dimitrios Pavadimoulis. Welcome to the European Parliament, Mr. Mitsotakis. Let me begin at the start by saying that during your government, it's impossible to hide from the first second of what you were saying the problems that your government has caused. Mr. Weber and uh, Mr. Mitsotakis, you started with personal and uh, attacks on the government of Mr. Tsipras. Let me say that things like that simply show that you are really still afraid of the government of Mr. Tsipras and what it achieved. The Prime Minister in the past was Mr. Tsipras, now it's Mr. Mitsotakis, in the future it might be Mr. Tsipras again. And you should respect the truth, and the truth says that the ND Party, the New Democracy Party, is largely responsible for the bankruptcy of the country because of the enormous amount of debt and the oligarchs and the enormous amount of debt they signed up to the memorandum the, with the Samaras Venizelos government. The banks were destroyed, enormous amounts of unemployment, enormous amount of retrograde steps taken as far as social conditions were concerned. It was almost like Greece was before they joined the European Union 40 years ago. That's what you should have been telling us about in your speech, Mr. Mitsotakis. Greece has got the highest inflation in the European Union. 12%, much higher than the rest of the Eurozone. It's the most expensive petrol in the European Union. Eurostat has said that 
that an enormous amount of prices are higher in Greece than in other parts of Europe. We've got not just unemployment and inflation, we've also got bankruptcies occurring now as companies go bust. We're also 26 out of 27 as far as press freedom is concerned. And do you really think that Reporters Without Borders who came up with these figures are just an NGO trying to interfere in Greece. We believe that it's a partner of the European Parliament, the Council of Europe as well, and along with the President of the Parliament, Ms. Metzola, there's going to be a meeting of the, with Reporters Without Borders, the people that you've just been attacking. So tell us why Greece is still top of the league as far as unemployment is concerned and 26 out of 27 when it comes to gender equality. We've got some of the worst performances in Western Europe as far as the pandemic response was concerned as well. As Mr Asman from the Renew Group said, Ms Strick from the Greens, the need to make sure that illegal behaviour is carefully monitored, particularly when it comes to things like freedom of the press, because things aren't going well in Greece as far as things like that are concerned. There's the question of the survival of the rule of law. As Commissioner Vester called for modernisation and speeding up of reforms in Greece, And uh, some people seem to think that a properly functioning legal system is a barrier to investment. In the Greek Parliament recently, you mentioned certain Greek journalists and you said some insulting things about them. The highest court in the land people who see to the question of justice and they found that those journalists were completely innocent of the charges which you had levelled against them. You should at least apologise to them for the things that you said. I am coming to an end, Madam President. Portugal is with its money from the Recovery and Resilience Fund coming up with plans to help young couples and students. What are you doing with that? Thanks very much. Next to Kostas Papadakis. The future that the EU is preparing for working people is one they're living in already with Poverty, unemployment, rocketing prices, energy poverty and green taxes which are financing the green and digital business. This has happened with all governments in Greece, including the ND, the New Democracy Government today, who are promoting the criminal policy of the green changeover, the phasing out of lignite and putting money... putting energy onto the stock market. Now you're weeping crocodile tears about who's going to be paying for these changes and the consequences of the sanctions against Russia. It's working people who are going to be paying for them as extremely expensive US LNG is being brought in. This anti-working class policy it also entails the breaking of links among working people. The, ex the removal of collective de bargaining and your government calls on the people to get used to living with unemployment benefits and in misery, unemployment benefits doesn't cover anything like the huge increase in prices as huge inflation becomes more and more rampant. All of these things in your speech show what the situation really is. The there's no basis for 
what you are claiming is happening. The huge failure to use the Recovery and Resilience Fund properly. At the same time, the danger of spillover from the Ukraine is growing. And once again, working people are going to be suffering because of the agreements that you've entered into with NATO. If Greece gets involved, that would mean that we'll simply be serving the desires of NATO, which will end up pre providing and producing even more refugees. What we need to do is try to protect ourselves from Turkish aggression. And this is opening the way to yet more exploitation of what's happening in the Aegean. The Greek people have moved from Pasok to Syriza, to Syriza, to new democracy. Only the people can save the people. There is a solution which is an increase in workers' struggle, fighting against VAT, the high taxes on fuel. All of these low wages and low pensions provided by the system which pays for imperialist wars with the assistance of NATO and the European Union, we need to start taking the riches where they can be found. Colleagues uh, who have uh, taken part in this debate, I invite once again the Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis to respond. You will see that there is quite a lot of commotion, but that's because members are coming to prepare for the vote and they would, I'm sure, be happy to listen to your replies. Okay. Thank you, um, um, uh, Madam uh, President. Let me quickly uh, address some of the points uh, uh, raised by uh, your um, uh, colleagues. First of all, uh, Thank you, Mr. Weber, for making the observation, which I think is fair, that Greece uh, is indeed back because the country today objectively bears no resemblance um, to the country that uh, we took over when the Greek people placed their confidence uh, in us uh, in July 2019. I think the progress that we have made uh, is uh, rather uh, objective in terms of the performance uh, of our economy and in terms of the intensity of the reforms that we have implemented. Uh, I would like to very much take note of what you said regarding the importance of structuring our democratic debate, be it at the European Parliament uh, or within our national uh, government, based on true facts rather than rumors or fake news. It is impossible to have a proper debate if we continue to question the basic facts. And let me take note of a point uh, raised by Mr. Papadimoulis when he falsely claimed that Greece has been the leader in the European Union in terms of COVID death per million people. This is a lie, Mr. Papadimoulis. It's plain false. And it is unacceptable that you show up in this house and replicate this type of misinformation. So let us at least get our facts straight when it comes to the issues pertaining to the, to the, public, um, uh, to the public debate. Uh, I think it is uh, very important to make sure that we can have a public discourse based on facts that are mutually uh, acceptable. Let me switch to, to Greek to quickly respond to Mr. Andrulakis. I'll switch back to English for the rest of my uh, uh, answers. Uh, I listened carefully to your observations, Mr. Andrulakis, on the recovery fund. I can assure you that our proposals for the fund have been accepted by the European Commission. They have a very powerful social component and what we were doing is spending the money on combating unemployment, supporting SMEs, trying to improve the situation in general. The energy saving programmes that we've put together will help all Greek households, particularly the ones who are poorest, they'll have priority access. On the weapons embargo on t Turkey, let me just say, 
that probably every European country is free to export weapons, but we need very carefully to bear in mind in all European countries the situation which exists in the Mediterranean. We have a country that has ambitions to join the European Union, Turkey, and openly calls into question the sovereignty of another country which has the good fortune of being a member of the European Union. That is something which European countries need to bear very carefully in mind when they take decisions and their choices on the selling of weapons to third countries. Respond to some of the points uh, made by Mr. Uh, Asmani. Uh, I took note, um, uh, Mr. Asmani, of your observations um, regarding um, um, press freedom in Greece. I can assure you, Greece is a country where everyone can write and publish anything about anyone without any censorship or any control by the government. Just uh, take a look, and I, I printed them here. They're just, uh, you know, two indicative front pages from today's newspapers, which uh, accuse me of being a, 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 a liar, a sycophant, and these are daily, daily front pages from at least four daily newspapers in Greece. And the same media freedom applies to TV, to radio, and of course the internet where everyone is free to write anything about anyone. And I would uh, urge you uh, to take some of these rankings which are published by uh, non-governmental organizations with a grain of salt. Does one really believe in this house that countries such as Chad in Africa have more media freedom than Greece? Because this is exactly what was presented in, in the rankings which you claim. Anyhow. When it comes, uh, 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 so when you, when you get advice from your new Renew colleagues, I suggest you dig a little bit deeper uh, in terms of the reality uh, of, of the Greek public discourse. We are a very dynamic and vibrant democracy, and I can assure you uh, that freedom of, uh, uh, of the press uh, uh, is an accepted reality in Greece for many decades now. And uh, frankly, you know, the Commission is going to publish its recommendations uh, regarding rule of law. Um, we expect them, uh, and we will look very carefully at what the Commission has to say. And at the end of the day, I think we can trust the Commission to properly assess the state of rule of law uh, in all uh, European countries. Mr. Strick, thank you for your comments. Uh, and I think you've raised some um, um, uh, valid points. First of all, regarding the lack of solidarity uh, offered to Greece, but also to other countries which are on the external borders of the European Union, when it comes to the migration issue. I would, however, like to, to point out that it is the right of every European member state to protect its borders with full respect for fundamental rights. This is exactly what Greece has been doing for the past three years. And uh, we have been successful in protecting our borders, and we have been successful in terms of breaking down the smugglers' networks that have really exploited the desperation uh, of uh, weak and traumatized people by encouraging them to embark on a very dangerous journey. And when you speak about pushbacks, I would urge you to think more in terms of push forwards rather than pushbacks. We have a statement between the European Union and Turkey, which requests Turkey to cooperate in terms of managing migration flows across the Aegean. When a sailing boat leaves a Turkish marina with 100 or 200 people on board. I think we need to be naive to believe that this is happening without knowledge of the Turkish authorities. We know very well that Turkey back in March 2020 weaponized the migration issue and tried to push tens of thousands of desperate people across the Greek border, exactly the same practice that Lukashenko did in Ukraine. There was nothing different. The playbook was written already by Turkey back in March 2020. So please, when you look at these issues, which are sensitive issues, let us not repeat the Turkish propaganda that they have no role in what is happening and that it is, you know, the Greeks who are behaving inhumanely in terms of not protecting fundamental rights. We have an independent anti-corruption agency 
which is looking at allegations. Some of the allegations, yes, are concerning and they need to be further explored. Having said that, I would like to point out that the reception facilities, because you made a point to the reception facilities today, bear no comparison to the reception facilities under the previous leftist government. Take a look at the islands now. Go visit Samos or Hios. You will find state-of-the-art reception facilities that were funded by the European Union, which have no comparison to the disgrace of Moria, which was a creation of the previous leftist and very sensitive, quote-unquote, when it comes to human rights um, uh, issues. Uh, this reality no longer exists. One last point in terms of integration. I think you will find this interesting. Yesterday, I welcomed to my office a 19-year-old Iranian boy. His name is Kurosh. Kurosh uh, made it to Lesbos in 2019. He entered a Greek school. He learned Greek. He gave his entrance exams to Greek university. And he will now be admitted to the best school in Greece when it comes to electrical engineering, having aced his national entrance exams. This is how this government looks at the integration process of people who have reached the European shores and have a right to be integrated into the European society. Now, um, when it comes to um, uh, the points raised by Mr. Beck and Mr. Frangoulis, um, uh, very quickly, um, uh, Mr. Beck, I ensure you that when it comes to uh, purchases of weapon system, uh, all the important weapon systems that we have purchased uh, over the past three years have been European. And I do believe that we need to purchase more European systems when we have that option. And I, we, I believe we need more integration of our defense industry in order to make it more competitive. And when it comes to the issues raised by uh, Mr. Um, uh, Frangos um, uh, regarding the, uh, the brain drain, uh, I can assure you that for the first time, Many young Greeks who left the country over the past decade in search of a better job are seriously contemplating returning to the country for two reasons. Because for the first time, we offer many good paying jobs and because they have an overall confidence that this country is moving in the right direction. We still have a lot of work to do to reverse the brain drain problem, but I think we have made some important first steps. Finally, finally, when it comes to the points um, raised by Mr. Uh, Papadimoulis, who was very, very eager uh, to defend uh, the previous government. Uh, I understand uh, his point, but I think it is improper sometimes, Madam President, to bring issues uh, pertaining to domestic politics to this House. I would only point out one reality, Mr. Papadimoulis. Seven years ago, there was a referendum which was led by your government, which pushed Greece to the precipice to the precipice of us exiting the Eurozone. And it was only because you reversed the decision of the Greek people, you made the famous now Kolotumba, which is a somersault, a U-turn, that you signed the third program and essentially condemned Greece to four unnecessary years of austerity. This is the reason, one of the main reasons, why you were voted out of power and why we came into power in order to make sure that we move Greece back to a proper uh, growth uh, uh, track. Uh, uh, finally, uh, when it comes to, uh, again, uh, issues regarding uh, rule of law, uh, we'll have an opportunity, Madam Speaker, and I will end here to have a discussion in the Greek Parliament tomorrow uh, regarding these issues. Um, what is a fact today when it comes to independent justice is that two of the closest collaborators of Mr. Tsipras the minister in charge of anti-corruption has been sent to the highest court of the country accused of tampering with justice and intervening in justice. And a second minister of the Tsipras government has also been sent to the highest court because he interfered uh, in a public tender regarding broadcasting rights. So this is a track record uh, of your government, you have two of your ministers who will be held accountable to justice for clear interventions when it comes to rule of law. So let this fact, the facts speak rather than use this chamber to promote fake news. Thank you again, Madam uh, President, for giving me the opportunity to address the European Parliament. Thank you.
Prime Minister. Thank you, dear colleagues. This closes the debate, and we go to the vote.